Welcome to Tabernacle of Praise Church International. We give God praise for another day that he's blessed us with. This is the day the Lord has made. We are to rejoice and be glad in it. I thank the Lord for allowing us to see another day. God, we give you glory. God, we give you praise. We give you honor. We magnify your name. Your name is the name that is above every name. Lord God, we praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you, Lord. You are the worthy one. You are the one who's worthy of our praise, who's worthy of the glory. You are worthy of the honor. And we praise your name this day. We pray that our worship will be as a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils. God, be glorified in us. Be glorified in this worship. Be glorified in this day. We submit to you that your perfect will might be done in our lives. We thank you for this time in your presence. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, we thank the Lord for this day. We thank the Lord for allowing us to see another Sunday morning, the second Sunday of 2021. And we thank God for all of you who've tuned in today and joined us in worship. And we pray that this worship experience will bless you and will strengthen you and motivate you to go even further in the Lord. For our scripture this morning, we are going to read just two verses from Mark chapter 1, uh, which is our theme scripture for today. And following that, we will be led in a time of praise and worship through our praise and worship ministry. Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 14 and 15. Now... After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. Do that. 
name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, hallelujah. Thank you, God, for calling me friend. Praise God, hallelujah. Amen. We thank the Lord for our praise and worship ministry leading us <clears throat> in this time of praise and worship this morning. Uh, we thank the Lord again for the opportunity to be here today and for all of you who are joining us uh, via uh, Facebook Live or other technology, or technology, excuse me. So this morning, as we go into the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, specifically verse 15, uh, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent 
and believe in the gospel. I want to talk about implications of God's kingdom having come. Implications of God's kingdom having come. So, Lord, thank you for this time this morning in your presence. Thank you for uh, your anointing. I thank you for the promise that when your word goes forth, it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish all that you desire and that you would prosper your word in the things that you sent your word to. So thank you for sending your word to us today. Thank you for what your word will accomplish in our lives. We submit to you. I pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit that I might minister under your anointing. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Implications of God's kingdom having come. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is uh, near, as the NIV states it. And that's, that's the, actually the translation that I would like to use because it, it speaks to something as we'll talk to you in this message this morning. So our theme for this year is the time is now. The time is now. During Holy Convocation, and I appreciate everyone who tuned in. I thank God for each one of the preachers that preached uh, as the Lord led them during this time of consecration. Each one of the messages in some way spoke or in part spoke about kairos, the specific moment uh, in time ordered by God and, 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 and how he used history and environmental circumstances when it was favorable, when the time was right for Christ to come into this world. Understanding Kairos is important for, for, the, for us understanding the history of Christianity, and it is important for you and me in our lives today, okay? It's important because God has ordained certain things to be fulfilled in our lives and, and, and in ministry as well, and in history, things that will bless us, things that impact the kingdom favorably, and things that impact other people's lives favorably, whether God chooses to use us uh, in those situations or not. It's important for us to understand Kairos. Uh, we don't want to miss those Kairos moments in our lives. We want to sense that we want to sense what God is doing. Uh, we want to always be available. Uh, to God so that we're ready to move, to do, to, to, to receive, or to say whatever it is that God has ordained for us at those specific moments in time. I believe, as I was preparing this, I believe that the founding of Tabernacle of Praise Church International was a Kairos event. God spoke it two years before it happened. However, I also know that it was in the plan of God and the purposes of God from the beginning of time. Looking back at that, uh, things had to be right for the birthing of this ministry uh, and, 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 and for things to take place the way that they did. And as difficult as, it, as the process was for me and, and some others, like a pregnant woman going through birth pains, when the time was right, this ministry was birthed. Okay? So today, <clears throat> today, the Lord has taken us back to the scripture that we expounded upon last week. Um, and has, has honed me in, uh, glory to God, to one particular phrase in that scripture. The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. Therefore, today, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God having come near and the implications of that for the body of Christ and for us now in this Kairos moment. Hallelujah. Now, the kingdom of God is the substance of Jesus' teachings. It also corresponds to and is identified uh, in the closest possible way with Jesus' own person and his ministry. Mark's verb choice, Mark's verb choice appears to reinforce the linkage of the kingdom of God 
with Jesus' person. For in declaring that the kingdom is near, near, okay? King James says, is at hand. But, but a better translation of that is that it is drawn near, okay? Understanding history and Jewish thought and the far near or near far thought patterns of, 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 of the prophets and, and, and the scribes and Pharisees in Judaism back in those days, then you get kind of a concept of the kingdom coming near, the kingdom coming near. Mark employs the verb in the uh, that, that occurs frequently in, in the New Testament references to spatial rather than temporal nearness, okay? So what Mark is actually communicating to us is that Jesus of Nazareth, is that in Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of God has made a personal appearance. In Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of God has made a personal appearance appearance that had implications for the people of first century Palestine, both Jews and Gentiles, and it has implications for us today. It has implications for us today. Glory to God. Amen. Implications that we can't afford to miss, that we can't afford to miss. As I was preparing this, I was thinking about things that were said as I was growing up in the church, you know, things about God sitting high and looking low, uh, things about learning to wait on God. You know, I just thought about some things that were said and, and understanding that, that people just saw the Bible. People just saw the Bible and they read the Bible and they may not have known the difference between Old Testament and New Testament and the connections and how to apply those differences in their lives. But they, they had a concept, they had a concept in their minds of, 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 of time. They may not have known all the technical terms. They may not, may not have known all the theological implications. They just saw the Bible and read the Bible. So they would say God was sitting high and looking low, but, but not really understanding fully what they were saying. And I pray that as I preach today, some of these things will come out, okay? Uh, 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 you know, when you look at God, when you look at this and you study God from the lenses of Scripture, and that's how you have to study God. Amen. If you go out and get a book about God that's not based in the Scripture, you're not going to get an understanding of who God is. But when you study God from the lenses of the Scriptures, you discover just how awesome, just how majestic, just how dynamic, yet loving and kind and caring God really is. So as I was preparing this message for today, I began to see that these few words spoke to then and now that we need to be aware of. I began to see things that these few words spoke to then and now as we need, that we need to be aware of as we engage in life, in ministry, and for us at TOP, uh, the theme that God has given us for this year, the time is now. Yes, God has called us to actively engage in the ministry uh, of his kingdom today, all right? This is first and foremost about ministry. It's first and foremost about ministry, engaging in kingdom work, spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God, okay? Repenting and believing in that gospel and calling others to repentance and belief in the gospel. However, you and I are human beings, right? Yeah, I think so. You and I are human beings, all right? We live in time and space. We encounter life situations that are sometimes difficult for us to handle. Okay, we are attacked by the enemy in our minds and our bodies and our relationships and our finances and what have you. As such, we also need to understand how the kingdom of God, having come near, affects us in our everyday life. Amen. The kingdom of God has come near. Okay, and in today's world, and in today's world, 
where the church has become so closely aligned with politics and the church leaders are pushing a particular political party, agenda, or person, it's important for us to refocus on the kingdom of God and it having come near. As explained in, in, in Mark, the expression, the kingdom of God, refers to the kingly rule, the reign, the dominion, the sovereignty of God in the hearts and the lives of people. So we can't say the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is there. It is in the, as he rules in the hearts and the lives of people. Amen. As such, God and his kingdom supersedes any of this world's nations or political leaders or this world's nations and their politics. We must always align with God, all right, and not be so tied to a political party, amen, all right, or a political party's agenda or their manifestos, if you will, okay? Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, all right? His message was repent and believe in the gospel. He did not come preaching repent and believe in a political agenda. Amen. Repent and believe in the gospel. His kingdom supersedes, for us in the United States, the Republican Party. It supersedes the Democratic Party. It supersedes MAGA. It supersedes Black Lives Matter. It supersedes Antifa. It supersedes all of these movements. It's important for us to see that. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the scripture makes very clear, makes a very clear point that we must all remember. It says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. All of these kingdoms will submit to Jesus. Now the Bible says, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, for many people it's going to be too late because, because at that time when everybody remembers and when everybody recognizes that Jesus is Lord, it's going to be too late for a whole lot of people because now is the time to submit. Now is the time to receive Jesus. Now is the time to submit to his, his kingdom agenda. Now is the time to love like he loves. Now now is the time to care like he cares. Now is the time to see things from his perspective. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul declares in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, that God has delivered us from the powers of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Glory to God. So we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we need to stop acting like we're of this world. We need to stop catching hold to everything that comes along and stay focused on the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So all of this is a part of the kingdom of God that Jesus came uh, proclaiming uh, that it has come near. And this is the reason for his coming. Yet we must understand how to maneuver uh, in the tensions of these two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of our Lord and his, Christ, and his Christ. Understanding what was wrapped up in Jesus' statement, the kingdom of God has come near, will help us stay on track. And the church needs to get back on track. The church of Jesus Christ needs to get back on track. Since I was studying this, Three things stood out to me that I sense the Lord wanted me to share today that will impact our understanding of the kingdom of God having come near and will help us in ministry and life today. In studying this, the first thing that was impressed upon me was that Jesus' statement, the kingdom of God has come near. As it is used in the Septuagint, now most most, most people who have not set under any theological teaching may not understand the Septuagint. But go and look it up and get an understanding. 
and, and it'll help you. As it is used in the Septuagint in, 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 in Isaiah 46, verse 13, and 51, verse 5, it expresses the nearness of God's saving action. And, and it challenges, listen now, it challenges the prevailing thought during a particular time in Israel's history that God was a bystander, that he saw what was happening to Israel, but he refused to intervene. You got that? When Jesus said, when Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near, okay, it expresses the nearness of God's saving action, and it challenges the prevailing thought during a particular time of Israel's history that God was a bystander. Listen carefully now. Listen carefully. That God was a bystander and that he saw what was happening to Israel but refused to intervene. I hope you hear in that some things that people say today. If God is such a loving God, why does he allow this to happen? Why does he stand by? Why did he allow this person to die? Why did he, why did he allow this? You know, God, God sits high and God looks low. He's not involved. He's just sitting up there looking low. I can understand that theology. Amen. Some, in some way, uh, for black people who suffered in this country and, and, and our people that went through slavery and, 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 and the oppression of Jim Crow and all, I can understand them sometimes feeling that God was a bystander. God, where are you? Well, this was a prevailing thought at one period of time in is Israel's history. Uh, God seemed far away from them. You heard me mention the near, far thought earlier on in the message. They felt that God was far away from them, and he didn't care about what they were going through. They felt that God was silent, okay? That was, and, and, and in essence, in a sense, there was a time when God was silent. We've identified that time. Theologians have identified that time. History has identified that time. There was no prophet in the land to speak to the people the prophetic word of the Lord or the fresh word of the Lord. That period was called the intertestamental period, okay? During these silent years, the Jewish nation, following the example of Ezra, amen, were very focused on keeping the letter of the law and not compromising the way, that the, the way that their ancestors had. Consequently, there was an expectation that the Lord would vindicate his people and that he would restore the pre-exilic kingdom. But what happened was continual persecution and, and, and continual oppressive leadership under five different nations. The Babylonians, the Greeks, the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Romans. And as a result, much of the view during the intertestamental period, intertestamental period turned toward the long for day when God would return and establish his kingdom amongst his people. During this time, there were persons who wrote, okay, uh, we have the apocryphal and the pseudofigural books that, that are not accepted in our, in our canon of Scripture, but they provide some historical insight and understanding of what was going on during that period. These writers took a deistic view that said that God had turned them over and removed himself completely from their affairs, watching but not intervening, intervening. Now, I'm not preaching from those books. I'm just giving you, amen, some insight, some background, all right, some insight of what was going on. And you know what's in their thoughts by what they write. If you write me a letter, I know what's in your thoughts by what I read from what you wrote, okay? All right, remembering the words of the prophet in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 and 6, which said, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. And then at the latter part of it, it says, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 
They believed that God had done just that, that they were under a curse, okay? Now, 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 now their beliefs brings up another sermon, all right, that I can't preach right now, okay? Because a lot of times when things happen and we blame God, we forget our actions that led up to it, okay? All right, so, so following the Babylonian captivity, they felt... Uh, they perceived that God was inactive in history. History was surrendered to evil, and all salvation was thrust far into the future. Far. And 400 years, because that's the time period, 400 years is a long time. 400 years after Malachi chapter 4, the end of the prophetic word in the Old Testament. 400 years after that, John comes preaching in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John also heralds Jesus, proclaiming in Mark chapter 1, verse 7, there is one who is coming after me, who is mightier than I, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the excitement and the wonder that stirred in these people not having a word from God in 400 years? Then Jesus comes preaching the time is fulfilled, the time has come, and the kingdom of God has come near. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That's why people were coming out in the wilderness. It wasn't easy to get to where John was. But they were coming out, the Bible says, in the wilderness to see John, to hear his message, and, to, and many of them were baptized. But in other words, Jesus' message now was, God is not just a bystander. God is not just watching what is going on in your lives but doing nothing. God is not sitting high and looking low. Now the time has finally come for him to speak and for him to move. I want to tell you today, my brothers and sisters, if you feel that God is silent in your life, if you pray and God doesn't answer your prayer right away, if you feel like he's left you alone to deal with life and life's challenges all by yourself, if you feel like he doesn't care about what is happening to you, I have a message for you today. The kingdom of God has come near to you and to me. It is present now. The terminology has come near actually means he is present now. Just be patient. God can move anytime he wants to move. But when he moves, it's going to be the right time. Can someone say right time? Kairos. Be patient and wait on him. He is here. He sees what you're going through. He sees the attacks of the enemy. He sees your suffering. God, hallelujah, has a time set to bring you out. And when he brings you out, when he delivers you, it will be the right time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. The kingdom of God has come near, near to you, near to me. It is right here. And it means that God is right here. Yes, yes. He's not far away. Get that thought out of your mind. He's right here. There's nothing you can go through that he doesn't know about. There's nothing that, come, that can come upon you that he doesn't know about. Hallelujah. Black people, there's nothing that we can go through. You might say, we've been going through a long time. We've been dealing with discrimination in America for a long, long time. Let me tell you something. God is near. God sees. God knows. And God has a time set. Hallelujah. Secondly, as I studied this, the Lord impressed upon me that Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God being near at that particular time shows us, listen now, shows us that God won't be moved by human opinion or human 
a, a, a human persuasion. It shows us that, that, that there are no big eyes and no little U's in the kingdom. Listen. The kingdom of God arrived in the fullness of time, not one day early and not one day late. Mm. The prophet had prophesied is coming and reading the history of the intertestamental period, the faithful Jews repented and were faithful in keeping the law. They restored the Aaronic, the Aaronic priesthood and they did everything they could to set the situation up for the time to come. But it wasn't in their control. Hallelujah. The determination of the fullness of time was not in their hands. It was not in the hands of the religious elite. It was not in the hands of the rich. It was not even in the hands of the, of the purebred Jews. So regardless of what they said, regardless of what they did, they could not persuade God or they could not push God to move any earlier. I've said this about fasting and praying. you got to understand the purpose of fasting. You can't twist God's hand. You can't make God move. You can fast for a thousand days. And if it's not, if it's not God's time to move, God is not going to move. He sees what we don't see. He knows what we don't know. And he has a time set. Glory to God. With the kingdom of God, one person doesn't have an advantage over another. We're all in the kingdom on level ground. I had a man say to me one time uh, in the situation that we were in in the church, he said, at the foot of the cross, there is level ground. At the foot of the cross, there's no bishop, there's no apostle, there's no prophet, there's no evangelist. At the foot of the cross, we're all followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and saying that, that ought to humble us. That ought to bring us down because some of us in positions of leadership have elevated ourselves above the people and we act like and we think that we are better than the people. Ooh. We forget the first and foremost of our we are shepherds. Shepherds of the Most High God. And there is no shepherd that doesn't have the smell of his sheep on them. Whew. So when you look at this, there are no big eyes, as I said, no little use in the kingdom. The rich don't, don't have more access to God than the poor. There's no such thing as white privilege in the kingdom of God. Whites don't have more access uh, to God than blacks. In the, the are red, yellow, blue, and green. In the kingdom of God, we are all equal in the sight of God. And our status in this world, or our educational levels, or our color of skin, our financial uh, 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 status in society, oh, glory to God, does not move God. Doesn't move God. Hallelujah. When the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt, so I was, the Lord took me to this as I was preparing this. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, it says, Now it happened in the process of time, does that word kairos again, that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And that cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard that groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Two things. God heard. Take courage in the fact that in your trials, in your troubles, in your tribulations, that God hears your cry when you cry out to him. But let me tell you something. Crying doesn't move God. Mm. Lord have mercy. If crying moved God, God will move every time somebody cry. People used to sing a song, oh, Lord, don't you mind me crying. I've been crying in the morning, crying at noon. I've been crying all day long. You can cry all day long, but crying doesn't move God. There was something else mentioned here that moves God, and it is that God remembered his covenant. With Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And then God acknowledged. It is in the covenant relationship that we have with Christ Jesus 
that God sees and God remembers not human attempts to persuade him or human efforts to push him to change his mind. If you are a, cov if you are a covenant son, if you are a covenant daughter, God will honor his covenant with you. Wait on him. God is faithful to his word. Numbers 23 and 19 said, as God said, and as God promised and not do it, as God said it and not fulfill it, yes, yes. So, when we look at this, the kingdom of God has come near. It reminds us that not only, uh, not only is the thought proven wrong that God doesn't care about his children, not only does the kingdom of God be a near show us that God is not moved by human emotion, human status, money, or opinion. But lastly, the kingdom of God coming near, hallelujah, shows us that God, hallelujah, in fact, does care about his people. It shows us, hallelujah, that God is, in fact, concerned about what you're going through in this world. The kingdom of God coming near shows us that God is a God of his word and that what he has promised, he will do. Throughout the times of the prophet, the Messiah had been promised. When Jesus Christ was born, he fulfilled his promises. And when Jesus proclaimed the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. It was God showing his people that he is, in fact, the God of his word and that he does, in fact, care about us. Paul declared in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Let me make a spiritual application for you today, just in case you need one. The kingdom of God having come near means that you serve a loving God. The kingdom of God having come near means that you serve a caring God. The kingdom of God having come near means that you serve an understanding God. You serve a merciful God. You serve a gracious God. You serve a kind God. You serve a long-suffering God. God help me today. Hallelujah. You serve a gentle God. Hallelujah. You serve a God who will make a way out of no way. Hallelujah. You serve a God who loves you in spite of you and who looks beyond your fault and sees your needs. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I thank the Lord for Jesus, and I thank God that he has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. That he has delivered me from the powers of darkness and that he has translated me into the kingdom of the son of his love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. Glory to God. Do you think God doesn't love you? You are included in the world. God so loved the people of this world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. John 3 and 16. And in Romans 5 and 5, the Bible says God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until I got myself right. He didn't wait until I cleaned myself up because I can't clean myself up from sin. But God showed me his love in that while I was still a sinner, in fact, even before I was born, Jesus already died, hallelujah, for my sins. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. First John 3 and 1 says, What 
manner of love um, the Father has given unto us uh, that we should be called the sons of God. Uh, God, I thank you today. Uh, the Lord, according to Deuteronomy 4 and 31, uh, the Lord your God uh, is a merciful God. Uh, he will not abandon you. Listen to God today. The Lord is a merciful God. Uh, he will not abandon you. He will not destroy you. He will not forget the promise to your ancestors that he swore that he would keep. Titus 3, glory to God, 4 through 6. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Hallelujah. Not on the basis of our works, glory to God, which we've done in righteousness because we've not done any works of righteousness. But he saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. Can somebody thank God today? He poured out upon us his love, glory to God, through Jesus Christ our Savior. First Peter 3 and 20 says, God is patient with you and me, not willing that anyone should perish, that anyone should be lost, but that all should come to repentance. Don't tell me that God doesn't love us. Don't tell me that God doesn't care about us. The kingdom has come near. The kingdom is here in Jesus. Hallelujah. He makes a way out of no way. Glory to God. He opens doors that no one can shut. He fights our battles. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He makes our enemies into our footstool. I just want you to know today that God cares, that God loves you that God is with you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Don't allow the enemy, don't allow the enemy to tell you that God doesn't care about you. The kingdom has come near. The kingdom is with us. The kingdom is here. Hallelujah. It is all around us. But in particular, when we allow Jesus to rule in our hearts, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, to rule in our lives, hallelujah, then we experience the kingdom blessings in our lives. It's here. It's here. You want to enter the kingdom? If you want to enter the kingdom, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said to John, hallelujah, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. How are we born again? We're born again by the Spirit of Almighty God. When we accept Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, that's a decision of each person's will. I can't accept Jesus for you. Amen? No ritual. Not, not even being baptized of Christians as, as Christian as children can make you a part of the kingdom of God. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the only way. Each individual, each individual coming to that point in their lives making the decision of their own will to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The kingdom of God has come near. And space, rather than time, it is here. You can enter in by receiving Jesus. The gospel, the good news, Jesus came proclaiming, claiming the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the way in. That's the way in. Repent for not having yielded your life to Jesus. Repent 
but not having believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Repent for having rejected Jesus and now believe in the gospel. You can enter the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So today, I've told you how to enter if you're not in the kingdom. Now, if you want to enter and it is a decision of your will, there's a simple prayer that you can pray. I will lead you in that prayer. I will lead you in that prayer. If you will, only if you will. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I've never accepted you. Which means also that I have rejected you as the Messiah, as the Christ. But I heard the gospel. I heard the message. I believe that you are the good news. You came to save me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. That's what I want. I accept you today. And according to your word, because of my faith in you, my belief in you, you saved me. Thank you, Lord. I receive my salvation now. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and it was a decision, it is a decision of your will. Not because I twisted your arm, not because somebody else twisted your arm. But you believe in the gospel, Jesus Christ, the good news, the Savior, the Messiah. Today, according to the word of God, you are saved. John 10 and, 10 and 10, I believe, says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons and daughters of God. To those who were born, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of the will of God. By your faith today in Jesus, you are saved. Take one other step. If you made that decision and you prayed that prayer, write to us so that we can follow up with you. There's a place on our website. There's a form you can fill in. Write to us. Let us know of the decision that you made. And one of our ministers will follow up with you so that we can help you grow in this process. Because it's not just about receiving Jesus. Now that you have received him, you want to submit to him. You want to grow in him. You want to understand this relationship and this responsibility that you have now to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a backslider, you at one point have come to Christ. And sometimes people, things happen and people get sidetracked. You can pray a prayer of repentance. The Bible says if we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The Lord is waiting on you. He's married to the backslider. He doesn't, he won't let you go. And you can, you can snatch yourself away from him, but, but he's not going to just turn his back on you. He's waiting on you to come back to him. Just ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I repent come back to you. I rededicate my life to you. Then write to us and let us know that you made that, that decision. Amen. I want to just pray for the body. I want to pray for believers right now because you might be going through some things. And you might feel like still after listening to the message that God has forgotten about you, but he has not. Go back and listen to this message again. Go back and do some study and you see God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget about you. No. We will walk away from God, but God won't walk away from us. So I want to pray for you today. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for every believer that's listening on this line. 
Thank you, Lord God, that there's nothing that we can go through in our lives that you don't know about, even before it gets to us. So, Lord, I intercede. I intercede for everyone that's listening. I pray for your grace and your mercy to be released, manifested, and insist in the life of every believer. Every person that's sick, I pray for healing. There are many people that have been affected by this coronavirus and other diseases. Good God, but I pray today by your divine power that you will move. Good God, I pray that by your divine power that you will intercede. You said in your word that, that you desire that we prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper. We know that healing is the children's bread. So God, we stand on the promise of your word. I intercede for people that are sick with diseases and other maladies. I intercede for people that are going through, for families that have been divided by misunderstanding and, and other things, Lord God. I pray, dear God, for families that have been broken up, Lord, by sin and other things. I pray for reconciliation and healing today by your mighty power as we open ourselves up to you and allow you to move. Be glorified. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for tuning in today. I pray that you've been blessed by the word of the Lord. I pray that you are encouraged because you understand better what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Man, it's here. It's here. You don't have to go looking for it. It's not there. No, it's here. God bless you. Please, if you want to sow into this ministry, uh, you can go to our website if you're blessed by this ministry and you would like to sow. Not that we are begging you for money, but we want to give you the opportunity to sow into the work of the Lord that's taking place here in the United States and in various parts of the world. We want to encourage our members to continue to give your tithes, your offerings. Don't forget the mission work that is going on, T.O.P., even though you're not coming and you can't put your money in the jar, amen, you can give a mission offering online. So let's, let's, we're starting a new year. We, we, we have a lot of work to do here and abroad. So let's join in. Let's sow into the kingdom of the Almighty God. Thank you. God bless you. Now may the grace of God, the love of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now and forevermore. And the people of God said together, amen. God bless you. God bless you.